Hello and welcome to another episode of Supercoach Insider. My name is Chris and uh, round one in the books, guys. Uh, it's good to be back. It's good to have uh, uh, some actual Supercoach that uh, impacts our team uh, for a change, which is really exciting. Um, I got, got to see a few of the games on delay, might I add. I, I, um, I had a pretty busy weekend uh, and so I didn't get to see, I saw the Thursday night game. Missed the Friday night game initially and then caught that up, obviously, with the Pies playing. And then I also missed the Saturday night game. Um, but then I did end up following that uh, up as well. So uh, busy Sunday and busy Saturday afternoon watching games. But uh, yeah, I'm excited. Um, unfortunately, my team's not so excited. Uh, I had a bit of a, not, I wouldn't say shocker, just, you know, I think like most people who went sort of the mid-price strat were a little bit disappointed with some of the picks. Um, and we'll go through them. I actually did a really great spready, um, Excel spreadsheet um, last night and just, just went through my team and, and what sort of chains we're looking at. I went through break-evens. I went through a whole bunch of stuff. So we're going to go through that in this podcast um, and I'll go through everything. But obviously I scored uh, 2,121, so not terrible. I did beat Ben, but I didn't beat Swizz. <laughs> um, uh, so season rank at the moment, yeah, not great. 46,216. That'll shoot up over the next coming weeks. Um, round one's a bit of a, uh, not an aberration, but it's a, um, yeah, some, some teams obviously who just hit, you know, would, it's really hard to ascertain what is a good team at this point. Um, but what my team does have is flexibility. So I'm not too worried at this point. Um, I'll go into a couple of, uh, a couple of different options for other people in this as well. And I'll also step through my thought process in the week, um, and round one, of course. Uh, so let's have a look at the team. There was a couple of changes. So I did announce these a little bit on Twitter. Um, and oh, let me, uh, before we do this, let's, let's go through and undo. How do I undo, undo changes? Yeah, well, let's, let's do that. So we'll be able to see exactly what we're doing. All right. So I went through, um, um, the, so the, the things that I brought in and changed from last week, I ended up bringing in Hall. Um, so I wanted to play him on field. So that was, that was a, a, a well, a decent in. I, I like that one. Um, I managed to actually get in Gibkiss. I don't think I had Gibkiss in my last uh, podcast, but I ended up, I was like, oh, I got, had the extra cash. I was like, yeah, I'll jump onto Gibkiss. Obviously that was a fail, but look, I think most people, especially competitive teams would have had Gibkiss. So it's not too worrying. Um, in the midfield, I actually added in George Hewitt. So with the Sam Walsh news that we had got late last week, I'm pretty, um, I'm not confident that he comes back anytime soon. Um, it sounds to me like that's going to be a, a fairly long-term injury, at least half the season. And the point was to try and capitalize on Hewitt being a, a mainstay CBA mid, um, and which in which we've seen before without Walsh and the team, he can average you know approximately 110 in that role. Um, I think he did it for an entire season two years ago, which we all jumped on when he was in defense. Uh, so I thought, look, I'll jump on the Hewitt train. I was a little bit disappointed in that game, to be honest. Um, he actually was third banana in that midfield. I had thought that with um, that Cripps would play a little bit more forward this year because they were playing shorter in the ruck. So they're not playing the two ruck system. They're playing just De Koning and, and Mackay backing up. So my thought process was that yeah they would uh, have Cripps play more forward time. That didn't seem to be the case. Cripps was the number one CBA mid, and he had a really great game. Um, and look, he he might even be a shout early, but he's not really at a good price. Um, so yeah, I do think that Hewitt's role is there. Uh, Chera just pipped him in terms of second, and he still had seventy percent CBAs. I'm not I'm not upset with that, but um, his score wasn't great, especially when you have rookies like you know I had McKercher that I didn't play on field, which I could have obviously fielded for Hewitt or I could have fielded for um, Sanders. The other one that came in was Berry. So I found the money to go up to Berry from Hustweight. Um, so he was obviously my team. Uh, and the other one was I, I put in Ware. And the reason for that is I actually had McRae um, on my last name. When he was announced for um, being the sub, I switched Darcy Wilson into the forward line and I took Ware. And the point of going for Ware was that obviously I couldn't go Carroll. Um, and I need someone to go to Carroll. So I had figured Jai Clark would be a good selection um, and would score quite well, and I didn't want to trade him out. So I was like, look, I'll get Ware in. At least I'm going to get one price rise, and then I've got a good excuse to just flip him. So I might make 20, 30K 
I know it's only a, you know, a small amount, but if I'm going to do a correction trade, at least I'm going to make some money out of it. So that was a thought process behind where um, he'll probably make somewhere between 20 to 30 K this week, regardless. So I'm, I'm probably likely to still see Carol next week, but I will go through, you know, likely changes and things like that. Um, I had the VC on Gorn. Um, so I got a little bit lucky there because my, my score otherwise would have been absolutely putrid. Um, but I had probably the best captain of the week, I'd say, um, unless you were you know, captaining Sarong, which I don't think many people did. Um, obviously, still uh, still held with the same forward line pretty much the, the whole time. So um, going through the list, now I've got a, this spreadsheet that I've got. I've got what what uh, t- I've got uh, a list of basically people who I think were you know were good in their and their role was good. People that I need to watch because I don't love their role and it's not exactly what I was I thought it would be, and then people that are injured or, or similar. Uh, so the good um, Dacos CBA mid killed it. He was close to best on ground if they were even close to winning. Unfortunately, that back line, for some reason, turns over the ball like it's going out of fashion at the moment, and they put their forwards under pressure, and it was too easy for Sydney to score out the back. Um, Amadi had a field day just marking everything. Uh, doesn't look like... And, and that gives me... If you are looking at Dean, face, for example, as a downgrade option from Gibkiss, look, I don't know if he holds his spot this week. Um he is a great intercepting defender, but not necessarily a great one-on-one defender. He doesn't do well against big bodies. He obviously doesn't really have the frame for that at this point in his career. Um, and his strength is basically Howe's role. So unless they switch those roles, I think what's more than likely is Frampton comes into play as that big body defender um, that they probably need at the moment. So... Um, I don't like uh, Charlie Dean's job security at the moment. Um, it's on a knife's edge on any given week. So just be careful with that. But yeah, Dacos was was close to best on ground. I thought he... Uh, look, I think if Collingwood win that game, he was brilliant and he was probably best on. Um, but there were some other... Obviously, the Swans just rolled over top. Heaney was fantastic again. So that was a really great role. Uh, I'm going to go through that. Uh, Short. Um, Short is on a watch list at the moment for me. So he still had kickouts, but um, Floston had the most kickouts. The problem with Short is he also was seen up playing on the wing a little bit. Um, and when so Carlton kicked like five behinds in a row, or like in the, I want to say, second quarter, and Short was off the field when that all happened. So a lot of the kickouts that were meant to go, or well, could have gone to Short, went to Vloston. And so that really impacted his score. He even got a little bit lucky because late he actually had a bit of a flurry and was pretty important in the dying minutes of the game. And he also had a goal. So his 88 score is a definite watch. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I think he's still averaging 110 because he got a 130 last week. Um, it's just one that I want to put on a watch list because there's guys at his price point, such as a Sheasel or, or example, that would be currently better. <laughs> um, so I've already lost 42 points on that. So that's great. Um, on to Young. So he's also a watch. Um, in the last quarter, Young was moved on in defense. He obviously only scored a 70 this week, but he had two frees against and a 50 against in the first quarter. And that really stunted his 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 points when the game was, you know, to there to be won early. Um, and then when they were holding off the lines in the last, he was moved behind the ball because they had a, a lot of injuries. So um, definitely a watch because if he is, you know, going back to that sort of half back role or even has to play tall, um, he's not one that I want to keep. And so he could be the one potentially that goes on to a Sheasel type or something similar. Um yeah, so watch this space for Young, but I think at this stage we kind of have to wait at least until team sheets are out before flipping him. And I want to give him another week, but we will see how that goes. I'm not locked into either way. Um, Yo, also a watch. So three of my defenders on a watch. Now, Yo was brilliant. I will say that. Like when he was around the ball, things happened for West Coast. It was fantastic. Um, there were times where I think, you know, Butters was trying to bust through. He stripped the ball on a tackle, grabbed the ball, um, and reversed it off for a clearance for West Coast. Um, there's a couple of things working against Yo. First of all, his time on ground was only 70% for the game, which is bad. Um, having a look through his history, when he scores well, it's usually up around the 80 to 85% time on ground. So that's one thing. Now that could be what they've said because of his injury history, we're not going to pay more than 70. So it's just something to monitor. If that's the case, then he's capped. Also, he moved to third banana in midfield. So he only had 64% to, um, CBAs. In the preseason, he was the number one CBA midfielder. 
Liam Duggan and Tim Kelly both had more CBAs than him. And that's obviously a reflection of the time on ground as well. But that's not what I want to see out of Yo. I want to see him as the number one or number two, you know, somewhere around the 75% um, CBAs. He still scored all right. Um, but if he was going to make cash, he needs to be, you know, hitting a sort of 105, 105s, 110s, things like that. So um, watch this space again because um, that could be, it could be a down or upgrade. Um, and there's a way that I, I can even go 100,000 onto him up to, up to Sheasel as well. So a few watches in the back line, but I kind of want to give them at least another week. We'll see how that goes. Uh, Howes and Hall both were good in their roles. Um, first half, I actually missed the first half of the game and they were a little bit light on in terms of scoring, but they really came into it later in the game. I felt like when I saw Hall play, the longer he was in the game, the better he looked. And towards the end of the game, he was you know, winning contested ball, taking contested marks and intercept marks um, and using it really quite well. So um, I think there's a lot more money to be made from these these two guys. And I think that they're both probably the pick of the of the defender rookies by a fairly long way. In fact, when I was looking at downgrading, say, a Gibkiss, there really wasn't anyone that I was interested in doing it. Like Caulfield was the best at 49, and I'm not loving his role, and I'll go through that a little bit later. Um, obviously, Gibkiss got injured. He needs to go. So the, the likely scenario is if you know Massimo has a good week next week, then he goes up to Massimo. That's the, that's what I want to do, but it's again, it's a, it's a watch at this point. Um, Williams is also a watch, to be honest. Um Two games in a row, he scored very well in the first half and died in the arse in the second. Um, that's obviously a fitness-related issue, not having a, a an extended preseason or anything like that. He's going to be working into his fitness, so you would imagine that he comes good at some point. But um, yeah, a little bit uh, annoying and frustrating as an owner when you had Massimo right there, which for the similar price went 122. Um, but another watch there. So the back line's not great. It's not looking fantastic, but um, we've got some moves that we can do to make it a little bit better, and best 18 does ease the pain a little bit. Um, so Bont was good, uh, but he was 76 at half time. so, you know, could have been anything, really. Um, he had a very uh, all right second half, but not nothing great, nothing spectacular. They kind of got dominated in the second half, of course. Um, Butters was good without being great, but still, still scored 118. Uh, the big thing with Butters is that they were treating Butters, and I, I highlighted this earlier in the piece, um, they were using Butters as a... Uh, uh, how do I put this? Uh, mainstay, probably you know one or two CBA midfielder earlier in the, off, in the preseason, and now he's dropped down to third banana. So um, JHF had 71%, I think Rosie had 68%, and then Butters was down in this around about 60 Now, that is still all right for Butters because he can score as a forward as well. Um, but I wanted to see him you know, really you know, bust out into an absolute premium this year and average you know, 120, 125 plus. I don't think that that's possible in a third banana role. So we'll see that. I'm probably holding him because... Trading him, tra- trading him to someone like a Green or a Sarong, that is that is literally the definition of point chasing. So I uh, probably will be holding him anyway, regardless. Uh, Nick Martin. So the good found the heaps of the footy, the bad butchered the hell out of it. Has the role. I can understand people wanting to move off him, but there's a, I want to explain something for a lot of people out there who uh, may be new, new super coach or maybe experienced players just need a reminder. There is such a thing as point chasing, but there is also such a thing as role chasing. Role chasing good, point chasing bad. What we are looking for in Supercoach are players that are in roles that have the potential and opportunity to score high points. Nick Martin currently has that opportunity. So jumping off him at this point only really makes sense if you're going to someone with an equal or better role at a, probably an equal or better price point. And right now, I just don't think that that's the case. Now, I will give him another week because I could obviously flip him to um, maybe a Crouch. Crouch at a 114 um, was second banana in that midfield. And that's off the back of a 115 in the preseason practice match. Um, he does look good. So Crouch is one that I could quite easily flip uh, Martin to. But I'm going to, again, give him another week and see. So a lot of these guys are good. rolled great, scoring terrible, but all good. Wines, massive watch. I was not impressed with Wines. Don't get me wrong, scored well, played well. His role, 
plummeted. So he was the mainstay number one CBA midfield all, midfielder all the way through preseason. And this week, his, t- his time on ground dropped and his CBAs dropped to 46%. That's areas of last year. That's what he did. Fourth banana midfielder, and that's what he was last year. Not happy with that role at all because I saw it last year. And if that's the case, there's a lot of 70s and 80s coming into that scoreline. And the fact that he got a 94, 96, that's probably because it was just West Coast and they just ran over the top of them. So I am very heavily watching wines. In fact, I'm at, I'm leaning towards trading him. So again, watch this space. We'll see what happens. Uh, but at this point, Wines is uh, is on the chopping block for me. He's the one in that midfield that I've got. The role wasn't good, and the, the score looked good, but I, I don't, I'm not confident moving forward. And you got to remember, Port have a gluttony of mids. You know, they also in that team played Drew, they played Mead, and they played um, Boak. Who play, they, you know, obviously a lot of those play, guys played wing, but they can also play inside. So th- there's not really a, a huge, huge need for Wines in midfield if they don't want to. And at any point in time, like we've seen this week, all of a sudden he's a, he's a fourth banana. Like, what the hell does that mean? So, um, yeah, not not loving the Wines roll, to be honest. Score good, roll bad. Um, Hewitt already talked about, but his roll is good, but the score was bad. So I'm leaning towards keeping Hewitt, even though he's got the buy this week, because I think that um, they actually have a the opposite problem. They don't have enough mids right now that they can plug into that mix. They're playing Jack Carroll as a 52% CBA midfielder, which is one that we've obviously got to watch. And if Walsh doesn't look like he's coming back, then you know his numbers should only increase really in there. So um, Hewitt has a good role, but a bad score. So again, chasing role, not chasing points. Very important distinction in Supercoach. Um, McCurchie, obviously good role, 88 points. Can't really go wrong with that. Scored, he was one of the guys on my on mid bench that um, I, missed on, I missed putting on field. Berry is another watch. So Sam Berry that I have, he scored an 80, got lucky with a goal right at the end. Uh, Roll was basically, he only had 32% midfield. In fact, he was fifth banana, not fourth. So in the practice matches, he was having around 50% CBAs. Now he's only down to 32%. Rankin had one more than him, and it was about 37%. Um, and he was the one saving grace. It was He was playing forward, which means that he will probably get forward DPP at some point, which is good. Um, and of course, the other saving grace is he was pushing up from that half forward line into stoppage as an extra midfielder, obviously because, first of all, Gold Coast have a massive midfield and they killed him. So um, I would say that I, I need more data with Barry. Um, but if next, next week, same role and, and, and doesn't score, well, then that's someone that you'd maybe look to move to say a Bonner or something like that but I'll go through a little bit of that later as well. Another watch on, on Sanders. So sub to three quarter time, had a lot of turnovers, but had disposals and had the marks, right? So he literally had a really bad turnover in the middle of the ground and then got pulled and subbed. It was crazy. I, could, I, was, I was like, Bevo, what are you doing, bro? Um, so need more data on him, but he's one that I could obviously look to trade next week um, and downgrade potentially. If he doesn't, if he pulls out another 40 score, that's not good enough. That's not going to cut it at 180K. Um, I'll look to get another um, cash cow in. So uh, we'll see with that. Uh, Clark, again, watch. 13 points and subbed. Probably going, I would say. He's probably the number one trade-out target for cash cows if you're looking. But unfortunately, he's only 123K, so you can't do much with him. Uh, but yeah, it looks like he's either not in the plans or not up to it just yet. Uh, where roll was okay. Um, you know, 46 points for him at a 123k playing mainly wing. Uh, Isaac Cumming has been re has re injured and is in the team with the other guys that came back, including Callahan. Uh, so it looks like he's got a bit of job security for the foreseeable future. Realistically, I'm only looking for a, a, another one week. But if it turns out that I'll trade Sanders instead because he spuds it up, I might hold uh, where past his buy. So we'll see how he goes. He's got one week again to prove that he belongs in my team. Um, Gorn absolutely killed English. He killed him, monstered him. Uh, he was fantastic. He was taken from the ruck. He's, he dominated the hitouts. Um, yeah, it was it was a it was actually a nightmare for Tim English. The only reason why Tim English got a half decent score was because of his work around the ground. He was getting absolutely monstered in, in the in the ruck. Um, Grundy was actually pretty good. He had seven frees against 
Like, it, you know, that's four points per free against. That's 28 points. He had a 71. You know, that's close to a 99 score. Now, don't get me wrong. It wasn't an amazing game from Grundy, but we saw the week before what he can produce, and I think that that's more on the cards moving forward. Um, I'm not worried about Grundy at all. Um, but let's say he drops another poor score. There's, you know, you might have a, a good um, look and say, hey, why don't we just go to Cherry next week? Cherry scored a 107. There is an opportunity there to make some cash. If Grundy doesn't pro- uh, provide a good score next week, I could foreseeably see people doing that that move. Uh, Flanders was brilliant. Um, again, he was uh, fourth banana in that midfield, but they played a very tight uh, CBA split. So he did get, I think, around 58% again. So um, not bad for Flanders, 125. Have to bring him in if you don't have him. I can't stress that enough. Um, we, if he goes at, at 125, he's probably going to go up 40, 50K. It might not necessarily price you out, but how do you plan to get him in after the buy? Right? I think he's probably the guy that most people missed a lot of people missed and, and they, they probably need Heaney at this point you've committed, right? So if you have Heaney, great. I have Heaney. Um, we don't know. And by horses comments, we don't know what his role will be like once Adams and Parker come back. And so if you've already pot committed to not having Heaney, I don't think you can bring him in now because you're going to have to trade, you might have to trade him out in two, three weeks, especially at his buy. Now, he might still make, say, 80 grand over these next couple of weeks. I don't think it's going to be 100, but it might be, say, 80. Um, so if you're doing it for a cash play, then yeah. But there's other better cash plays. Like Hogan, if you bring in Jesse Hogan, he's cheaper, he's 60 grand cheaper, and he's tipped to make at least, I think it's a 71 with 108. And he should shit that in. Um, against West Coast. So I would probably, if you're just playing a cash play, I'd probably prefer to get, Ho- get Hogan in than, than get Heaney. So um, obviously the buy is the issue with Hogan because he, he's, he's got to buy next week. Uh, but yeah, if cash is your, is your primary activity, then Hogan's probably a better play. Uh, Fife, if you don't have him, get him. Roll was brilliant. Welcome back, Fife. Tunned up for the first time since 2021. Um I know a lot of people faded him in, in, in favor of James Jordan, uh, which is fine. Um, Jordan's one that I'm looking at um, because I faded Jordan for five. Uh, so I think that he's one that you absolutely must get in. The question about five is, of course, well, if he's just going to get injured at some point, then you're wasting a trade to bring him in and you're wasting a trade to get him out, obviously. But he's going to make cash. So don't think him as that. If he goes on a a run of say 90 plus scores over the next few weeks, he'll make easily a hundred grand. Um, you just got to try and get him to say round seven, round eight until you get him to 400 K, maybe even 450 K. Uh, but yeah, he was, he was great. And so I would hundred percent recommend bringing in Fife if you have him. Uh, Fisher is a watch obviously. So he still had four kickouts, but the interesting thing about Norse kickouts, Bailey Scott had six, Sheasel had five. So that wasn't on my bingo card. Bailey Scott having six kickouts and, and Fisher only having four. Like, what? where was that? Like, he was the main kickout taker in the preseason. So uh, I did not see that coming. But having said that, he still had 21 touches. He just butchered the ball. So the role is still there for what we are looking for from Fisher. And a, and a guy that can average you know, 90 plus and be a keeper at 378 is still available. I understand though, again, this is the sort of same with the Martin pick, right? Like I understand that people need cash or they are looking at that and he's the easiest trade out option based on information that we already have. But realistically, we kind of had the same information we had two weeks ago. Um, he's still playing that same role. He just butchered it and got a really poor score. He scored more in the qu- quarter one of the practice game than he did this entire game. And that just goes to show you, you know, how important efficiency is, especially when you're dealing with uncontested possessions in the back line. Um, now, what will impact him is, yeah, Sheasel, obviously. So how does Sheasel's role change during the season? Maybe it only changes once Fisher starts hitting his kicks. Um, so I'm keen to give him another week, but he's very close to chopping block material next week if he spuds it up again. Um, I think it's more likely though that what people what happens is people trade him out and then he pumps out 110 and everyone goes ah I shouldn't have done that so buyer be or seller beware 
If you sell Fisher, be prepared to deal with the consequences of big scores that are incoming. Uh, Reed was good. Roll was okay. So he was a fourth banana in the midfield, not a third banana. Um, and he, he dropped down to 43% CBAs and had behind the footy. But he had 88% disposal efficiency, which is why you've got a decent score um, with his lack of possessions because he only had 16 touches. So uh, he's good. He's not great. We'll see how he progresses. He, I thought it was very impactful with ball in hand. And a lot happened when he touched the footy. So um, he's a player, that's for sure. Uh, Sexton's role was okay. He only had one kicking, but there was only, I think, four or five kick-ins for the entire game. So you didn't really get to see it, but still had 17 touches and seven marks and you know, did it at 71% efficiency. So that gets it done. Look, I know it's only a 63, but he'll have some spike games and make enough cash. So that's fine. Uh, Wilson is a bit of a watch. So mainly played forward. His heat map was very, very forward, but he kicked two goals, one. So the role isn't great. He is not an on-field option. I would be getting him off your field if you can. He is a bench option only because these, this sort of role is really, really difficult to cons- consistently create scores from, and I wouldn't be banking on it. So didn't really push up higher up the ground like he did in the practice match. He was definitely playing more of a forward pocket, fo- half-forward flank, and stay at home in that area, and I, I didn't like that for him. Uh, Cabman's obviously a watch. Look, he was a rental anyway. I only really looked to him to get the, the spike games out of him, and then we'll probably ride his cash gen out. Uh, but he had, he had one hit out, which was great, um, but kicked two goals, one from eight touches, and then had a decent score because of it. So um, lo- likely we'll need to get off the train it basically as soon as these easy fixtures roll around, um, roll back, but we'll see how we go. Uh, so that's my team, guys. Now I want to go through to... There's, there's a bunch of people that I... Um, that I wrote down, okay, these are the guys that I'm looking at and I want to have a look at their scoring, what their roles were, um, when I need to bring them in and make a plan about it. So I actually wrote down like 25 names and I've split them into two categories. So the categories are um, price rises in round two versus price rises in round three. So obviously with them only going up in, in the third round, We've got a little bit more time. We, we don't necessarily have to move today uh, on the, or this week on it. But having said that, there are guys that you're going to want to bring in next week. So if your plan is to get more than you know, your allotted trades, more than two or three if you boost, um, then you might need to go early on trades this week in order to make sure that you do that. And the other thing is, of course, because those price rate rises go up, unfortunately, we don't get to see regular guys like a Fisher or like a Young. We don't get to... Um, see them for two games to really ascertain more information about what their role might be. So that's a bit of a, a bit of a bummer. All right. So the first one off the rank is Billings. So he scored a 119, has a break even of five now, and his price is 244k. So he'll go up this week, and he'll go up 30k with a score of 70. Now the problem with with Billings of what I saw is that his role is just okay. It's not amazing. It's okay. And what I mean by that is he played high half forward and he pu- pushed up to the wing a lot. And a lot of his disposals were wide wing. So he doesn't push, push up, he's not pushing up to the stoppage or anything like that. He's playing a very wide winger who pushes forward into the forward line. Now, they obviously need that as a tra- he's a transition player, essentially. What that will definitely mean is that he will have some big games and then he will have some shit games. What we've got to try and do is ride the wave of the good games and hopefully you don't get any of the shit games, right? Now, we've obviously already said that he's a bit of a sub-risk, but I'm not sure now with that big game because he was he was close to their best on the day. So is he a must-have? No. But if you can facilitate it into your team, I am okay with it. Um, now, who I would prioritize over there? So we've got really the three guys around the same price point. I would absolutely have Fife ahead of Billings by an absolute mile. And I would also have Jordan over him by an absolute mile. So James Jordan is the next on the list. He scored an 84, so back-to-back 80 scores. He has a break-even that's lower than um, than uh, Billings, which is negative 12. And he's set to go up 32K with a, with a score of uh, 57. So he likely will go above that. So he's probably going up, let's, let's call it, a, he gets another 80 score. He's going up 40K, all right? Um, now to me, his role is a lot more defined. So whilst he is a winger, 
He had 46% CBAs this week. So this could be a great short-term rental. So while, again, Parker and Adams are out of the team, he had 21% CBAs last week, and they improved that to 46% this week. So my thinking of that is it's just a much more reliable scoring profile and pattern, at least until they get they come back, which is likely after their buy. Now, I don't think we'll probably have James Jordan after the buy. I think we probably trade him at his buy. So you're riding him for three price rises, which may get you what you're looking for is a 40K this week and then two 30K price rises. There's 100K. So I think bringing Jordan in if you don't have him is a, is a good idea. And I think it he's more likely to do that and he's more sustainable in his role than Billings. So I do think it's Fife, Billings, sorry, Fife, uh, Jordan, and then Billings. So if you don't have all of them, Start start getting them. If you have one of them, consider the other two. Um, potentially bring in both. Like you know, there are opportunities to do that with certain teams. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think he probably makes about hundred k before his buy. Uh, Raul, 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 Raul. What to do with uh, Matt Raul? Had him last year. This was not him. But there's some really great things. So obviously, a one fifty five is a great score. He has a BE of twenty five. He's priced at five seventy one, so he's obviously a cheap premium, a cheaper pre- mid premium, and he's pro- tipped to go up thirty five k with one hundred and one. So if his form continues and he goes one twenty one thirty plus, he's probably going up forty five k, maybe fifty k. So he's going to be definitely plus six hundred. The good and the bad. So he had ninety three percent CBAs first week and eighty four percent CBAs this week. So that's a great. He had ten tackles this week. So we know he's an inside bull. What we've wanted to see from Rao, we still haven't seen. And that is, unfortunately, his lack of marks around the ground. He's only had one in each game so far. And his ability to get outside ball, it just it just doesn't, still doesn't seem to be there. Yes, absolute midfield bull. He can score big with contested possessions. But when that dries up and they're not dominating the mids like they have been the last couple of weeks, I worry about his scoring potential. I owned him last year, and this is the same Matt Rao. He's just had a couple of really big spike games really early. Do I want to jump on it? It's not really a cash play. It's a season guy with an early buy. I personally think that Raul is a, if you have him, great. If you don't have him, he's not a must-have rush in straight away. You might say pick him up later if, if you can turn that around. Uh, Hogan is the is the cash play. So as I said earlier, so scored a 165. Break even of negative 46, which is, the, I think, the second highest break even this week, or second lowest, I should say. He's priced at 419K, so 71 with a 108. So I reckon, look, he probably, because this week he'll go up, and then that 165 will still be in his price cycle first week of the, after the buy. So if you bring him in, you can't trade him out next week. You've got to actually hold him for another week to get that secondary price rise. He should make. Look, he could make a... If he goes well against West Coast, there's every chance he makes 130K from here and, and he's, you know, 550K at the um, after the game after the buy. Um, so I don't mind that as a cash play if, if it works for your team. Uh, and how you how you do that, obviously, is, is up to you. I don't I don't hate it. A little bit like the Tex Walker play from last year. It was last year, I think. Tex Walker went on a big heater early and then people jumped on him and then they made, you know, 150K. And then the good people jumped off at the right time and the bad people held him and then he dropped all the way down and lost cash. Um, so yeah, if you want to do it, do it, but then you know, jump off at the appropriate time. I personally have too much going on in terms of correction trades to sort of make that. So it doesn't look like that's something I'm going to do, but I can understand other people doing it. Took Miller, 137, BE of 49. He's priced to 545K. It's going up 20K with a 94. So again, if he um, hits say a 110, 120, you're looking at a 30 to 35k price rise that still puts him at say a 575 to 580 range, um, which is still pick upable after his buy. So for that reason, I don't think it's again a must bring in this week. But yeah, here's the thing. Here's the thing I don't like about Rao. So he only had 68% CBAs last week. It was 78%. So he actually dropped 10%. But he had a crazy points per minute, which means he was super effective. And he had 84% time on ground with nine tackles. So that's a lot going for him. But I worry that that's not sustainable with that lower CBAs for Tuke Miller. So again, not a not a must-have. Would like more information. Uh, I'm happy paying 570 for him if he proves me wrong next week. 
Anderson. So I've gone through literally all three midfielders from the Gold Coast. He hit a 128, um, break even of 74. He's, he's already 586. He's only tipped to go up 12K with a 101. So if he, even if he goes up to a 120, it's probably about a 20K price rise. He's just over 600K. Um, he had back-to-back 74% CBA games. The thing about the thing about Anderson that I like more than I like the other guys, he is a lot more outside than the other the other players. He had a low DE, but still went at 122. He just gets used in transition a lot more and gets a lot of disposal around the ground. So um, he doesn't necessarily need to be the clearance guy because you've got Matt Rao there, but he does collect it in transition a lot more than the other guys. Um, so not a must-have, but one to watch. He's just got a perfect SC game because he can win inside, wins it out, um, and I really love Anderson as a player. Lockie Whitfield, 118, um, break even of 62, um, 519k. So he's going to go up 20k with a with a 106. So again, not a not a massive win, but he only had one kick in last week after six last week. But North only kicked four behind, so that's something to keep into consideration. So um, I think Himmelberg had two, and I'm not sure who took the other one. Maybe Lockie Ash, um, but he's definitely playing behind the ball. He's back to the traditional Whitfield role of old. Not playing wing, not playing half forward, pushing into midfield. He is behind the ball uh, and he's collecting disposals at will. So, uh, yeah, one to look at. The problem is his body, right? Like, we all know that Whitfield can score if he's got the right role, but he breaks down after six weeks and then he, he he's killed. So, if you're on the Whitfield train, great. If you're not on him, I suppose the only reason why you wouldn't be is because you're worried about his body. And so then is it worth bringing him in? Because you, I don't think it's a cash play for Whitfield. I think it's a, I'm bringing him in because I believe he's a season keeper. And I just don't believe that with Whitfield. So uh, Tom Green um, scored 152, 60 break even. He's already 621K. He goes up 28K with a 122. Um, he had 78% and 88% CBA. So they look fantastic. Tackling well, marking well. Um, I think he had you know six six tackles, seven marks, or something stupid like. Plus, a go- he's had a goal in both games. His only ex- issue is that is this a flash in the pan because of the easy fixture? And of course, his, his his price is quite high. So, who are you pivoting from him? So, I can imagine, you know, the guys that are around that six twenty k mark all scored pretty well. So, Sarong went well. LDU went well. He he scored a one twenty one. You know, Butters scored a one eighteen. Um, who else is in that price range? I'm not too sure off the top of my head, but I think that all of those guys scored really, really, really well. I don't think you're pivoting from that. The only consideration is if you were like gung-ho on maximizing value and you went, all right, I'm going to take a punt here and I'm going to trade Bont down. If I can get Bont scoring out of green this year and make 100K from a single trade, or not make, but generate cash for your team then there's a consideration there. So I can see people doing that to free up cash to make upgrades elsewhere. Um, but that's probably the only way that you're getting in green, right? Unless you say Martin up and somehow in the other, maybe Fisher down, Martin up. Yeah, that's another possibility. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't love that. So I think really most likely, especially with his buy, you miss the boat. You know, you, you I don't think you can really jump in on him. You probably miss. You're probably not going to be able to afford him after the buy anyway. So he's kind of one you got to wait during the season. Also remember, GWS also have the round twelve buy as well, so their first buy there. So he's one you can upgrade to, say round thirteen, if he drops a low score before then. So keep an eye on him. But I, I personally, unless unless you're doing that sort of bond play, I'm not really interested. Um, Windsor. So we get into the rookies now. So Windsor um, hit a seventy two. He has a B of negative thirty. Um, he's 180k obviously and he's going to go up 34k with a 45 in, um, score now I'll go through a couple of things first of all he has a traditional wing role so just going up and down the wing um, has been okay and he'll make money but he was subbed and that's an issue right because he could be the sub or he's going to get subbed so if you have him obviously you hold because his, his score was still good with that sub but I wouldn't be trading him in based on the sub risk and I wouldn't be trading him in um, based on his price. Because I think that others potentially could make more that are cheaper. Um, so yeah, I'm not trading into him, but I can understand those who have him, they're probably keeping him. Um, so Tom Berry is the other one. So 102 score and a negative 75 BE. So he has the best BE of the week and he's priced at 163K forward 
and he's priced due to go up 58k with a 52, um, which is doable. Now here's the thing that I love most about Tom Berry. He's playing the classic dimmer half forward. So not say the Billings half forward where he, he's half forward wing transitioning the ball, blah blah. They push right up to half back and then they transition the football forward with running power and they apply pressure at the lines at half back and they try and get out the back for, for goals. So first week, he only had six touches and he scored a 62. How did he do that? Well, he had he had quite a few tackles, but his effectiveness obviously with the ball was really, really impressive. And those roles in for Dimmer just score. Second week, 17 touches three, uh, and a goal. So he's only scored one goal between the two prices, which is great because that means he's not just necessarily reliant on scores. Now, don't get me wrong. Tom Berry is not the greatest footballer, which is, I suppose, the knock on him. You know, he's not touted as a hugely talented player. But the numbers don't lie. He's going to be a great cash grab. And I think that he quite easily makes 100K, probably closer to 150. And if he has another great score this week, then it's going to be fantastic. Do I think that he's an on-field guy? I probably wouldn't do that. Um, but this week with best 18, maybe you could take that risk. But I think at this point, he's the most obvious downgrade option by a long stretch. And he's kind of a guy that you've got to get on because he will make money and you'll be left behind if you don't. Um, so definitely think that Tom Berry is a must-have this week. All right, now looking ahead, I'll go through some guys uh, that i seen that I, I'm watching for next week. So first of all is Matt Crouch. Again, as I said, 68% CBAs. Second behind Dawson. Laird only had 53%. So despite that amazing score... He actually only had 53% um, uh, CBAs. So there's a, a sneaky chance that he... I don't know if he played forward during that game at all, but maybe we get something to monitor. If he's only going to be a 50% 50, 50 CBA guy, he might uh, be smashing that round six forward button. Um, Crouch only had 73% time on ground, but that's pretty standard for Matt Crouch. Like He generally tops out at like 75% anyway, so I'm not too worried about that. Heavy consideration for me for next week, but one I need another week on. Massimo was brilliant. D'Ambrosio um, scored a 122, wing and floating behind. So instead of transitioning the ball forward, he's wing and then floating behind the defense um, as playing as that sort of defensive sweeper that comes across. Uh, was a little bit everywhere. Um, his map and his, his possessions are just all over the place. His positioning was really, really good. Sometimes it's like he was just the only person there, and that's why he got the, the, the points in the score. Um, he does look very good. However, that role, again, is subject to throw out really, really poor scores. So do not... I, I personally wouldn't be jumping on him this week unless you absolutely needed a scorer. Remember, it's best 18. You get another week, so maybe wait a week. You, you know, Gibkiss isn't going anywhere. His score's not impacted, whatever. Um Try and wait a week if you can. It's always important to super coach to get people on their bubble, not before, so you can get the most information possible. She's all looked fantastic. Second in kickouts, took nine marks, 91% disposal efficiency. He literally had two touches forward of center for the entire game. So this whole midfield forward thing doesn't seem to be the case at all with She's all. Uh, I am looking at a few options to get him in the team, but I would say, again, kind of waiting for another week on some other guys, and then we'll go from there. So um, she's all I can see is coming into a lot of teams if you don't already have him, but I know a lot do. Um, Sarong had 85% CBAs ahead of Fife and Brayshaw, so Fife was second. Um, Young pushed out in the fourth due to the injury to the defenders, so that's an interesting one. But he did have a stupidly good game. He had high marks, high tackles. DE of 80% for an inside midfielder is insane. 86% tog. Look, that kind of um, stat line or box score is really unlikely to be repeated anytime soon. Um, but yeah, one to watch because if he explodes and goes crazy, then whew, who knows what could happen this year. Um, so Carroll scored a 74. He'll be a, a, a in next week likely. So he had 52% CBAs and fourth banana in that midfield. We'll know a little bit more about Walsh as well and whether or not he's coming back or if he's going for surgery, uh, which looks more likely than unlikely. Um, but he scored better in terms of points per minute last week. He had a lot of impact on the game, whereas this week he wasn't as good, but had more time on ground, so therefore still managed to put up a 74. Um, so at this stage, next week's probably Sharp versus Carroll, because Sharp also had a 70, which is also on my list here, but pretty much very similar to D'Ambrosio in terms of his, his, um, 
his heat map. So 18 touches, 14 with kicks, eight marks. Um, didn't have a, a kick in or anything like that, uh, but was winging and floating behind the ball. So um, yeah, very very similar. Um, Jack Steele, 87% CBAs. Now, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more touches, but he still had 25 of them. Like, I want to see him up around that 30 mark because that's the steal of old. That's when we know that he can really score. But his uh, box score, again, was filled up. So he had seven marks, six tackles, 83% tog. That's a great sign for Steele. I don't know if I can fit him in, but I'd be, you'd be stoked if you had him because that that's a great stat line and also really positive signs as the number one mid at St. Kilda. Here's a watch, guys. J- J- uh, Jason Lord Francis had 112. He was also the leading CBA mid for the game with 71% C- C- uh, CBA, but he only had the 20 touches. How he scored well was he had 85% disposal efficiency and kicked two goals. So we saw Jason Lord Francis with a lot of CBAs last year where he just didn't score. If he goes back-to-back good scores, do you consider bringing him in at 434K? It might be a little bit trap-worthy, to be honest, because of his high disposal efficiency. And that's not typically what we find from Horn Francis. He, he, try, he usually tries to bite off a little bit more than he can chew, and it negatively impacts his scoring because of that. So one to watch, but I'm definitely watching that. Bonner with a 102. Eight kick-ins for Bonner. So also uh, uh, Nasaya Wangani Malira had eight as well. So they split it 50-50. So, uh, but he had 28 touches. Now, if he go, do, goes in the role the same next week with Sinclair in the team, I kind of think he's a must-have next week. So, the, there's a, there's a couple of issues with that. I uh, people have said, oh, when Sinclair comes back, he'll go into the midfield. All right. Well, explain to me how a guy who's had a calf, a degenerative calf issue over the preseason, is all of a sudden able to run midfield kilometers. That doesn't make sense to me. I think it's more likely that he's um, he's eased back in from the half back line and then eventually goes back into midfield if that's the way that they want to see, see it structured. But him going straight into the midfield makes no sense for me from a, a fitness perspective at all. Um, it's not like when you've got a calf you can run. You, you, you can't. You can't fully load that that um, that calf while you're rehabbing. So uh, yeah, I would be shocked if that happened. But I need to see it. So I'm not. That's why I didn't start him. We now have another week with Sinclair in the team to determine role and determine what the changes might be. Uh, Dempsey. So he, I am flat out no with Dempsey, but he scored 96. He looked very, very good, but he's a small forward. And again, these guys have these very um, fluctuated scores. Uh, he's 148K, but he kicked three goals one. He did look very good, but his heat map is purely forward and not flattering. So at this stage, I'm a pass and I'm not looking to bring him in because I think that he might not score as well this week and it could just be a flash in the pan kind of score. Uh, but he's one to watch, uh, definitely. One that I really like was Weddle, Josh Weddle. So didn't take any kickouts and still um, still went uh, 94. Um, having said that, there were only five kickouts for the game and Ammon had, had three. So I need more data on, on Weddle's role, but he just looked at, he was everywhere. Any time the ball was, they were trying to transition him, they were looking for Weddle or with his run pace and foot skills to be able to transition the football. And I really like him. He's at 373K. I had him in one of my iterations of um, of teams earlier in the season, but he's definitely someone to watch. If he does get kickouts next week, I'm jump on. Like, absolutely. I think that that would stabilize his scoring ability. Um, but yeah, we'll see how that transitions. Ammon had an 89 at 483k. Look, I don't think he's one that you need to rush out and get, but if you have him, you're okay. He did take three of the five kickouts, so it looks like he's on the majority kickouts. I will say, though, I mean, Sicily going out for a week doesn't give us the information we need, but Sicily wasn't getting into that game. What they needed to do was to get Sicily onto kickouts, but there just wasn't any behinds. Like, they, Essendon was so accurate for goal that they couldn't just give Sicily bulk kickouts and say, yeah, just, just go and get involved and, and we'll damage them from your transition play out of... Um, out of kickouts, couldn't didn't see that because it wasn't available. So um, I think there's others better at his price, like say Matt Crouch. I'd probably be more keen on, um, but we'll see. Um, again, another another week of information on that one. Uh, now the one to seriously watch is Tom Powell. So he scored a 95 and he's 312k. So this could be one of the Fisher to down. So I'm looking at okay. So if 
if Powell maintains this role and scoring next week, I'll be probably and Fisher doesn't. That's probably the move I'll make. Seventy six percent CBAs. It gives him second banana behind LDU. Um, he played on ball. Here's the thing: he had twenty six touches, only four marks and one tackle playing in midfield, but eighty five percent DE, which is why he was able to manage to get to ninety five. Um, so one to watch. Not a must have at this stage, but he could be next week. So um, someone to look at. And the last one I got on this list, just because he's the only really like viable defender upgrade or downgrade, I should say, is, is Caulfield there at 49. He got a 49, 123K, didn't get any to kick outs, 10 touches and four marks, it was just average. But if he's there, if he's like a D8, then, you know, whatever, you could do worse. Um, I wouldn't recommend Dean for um, stuff mentioned earlier. So there you have it, guys. That's kind of my review into the team, um, into my team, and of course the, the the team moving forward and opportunities. What I'm looking at doing, um, I'll just go through and structure up. So, as I said, the one that's probably the, the the one that I am most keen to trade out at the moment is Wines, which is I know it sounds weird. You know, Martin played worse. He's got the highest score out of my three mid prices. Why would I do that? I'm chasing role, not chasing points. So trading him out is the first step. And Jai Clark, honestly, what are you doing, bro? Seriously. Uh, so yeah, not keen on Jai Clark either. Um, here we go. What's happening here? Oh yeah, they're finally caught up. Um, so Jai Clark, you know, now I need to bring in the, the guys that I want from this list. Uh, James Jordan, who I think is the second of that. And I definitely want uh, Tom Berry. Now, if I wanted to boost, I could possibly bring in in um, uh, in Billings, but I can't currently fit that into my team anyway. The only way to do that would be to completely get off of the Fisher pick, and I'm just not ready to do that. I want to give him another opportunity to prove me wrong. Um, so that's the, the situation at the moment. Now, in order to do this, obviously I've got to move some guys into midfield, so um, to free up a spot in here. So what I'm going to do is just put Darcy Wilson um, into midfield and then I can uh, it opens up the BEs. Now I'll just put in here, break-evens. All right. So Tom Berry, number one, with the break-even. Bang. As I said, Carol's one to watch for next week, but we'll wait on that one. Uh, Windsor, uh, for the sub reason, not interested in doing that. Jeremy Sharp is a week away. Where's the guy that I'm getting? James Jordan, just here. Negative 12. All right. So that's what I'm looking at doing. And here's what that allows me to do. So I'll complete those trades. It leaves me with 177K in the bank. Now, another consideration for my team that may not be applicable to other teams is that I started with 13 premiums, or I should just say, you know, guys that were, say, 400K plus or whatever. Um... So trading out wines, I'm still left with 12. So it doesn't impact me as much as others, but I understand what people would be thinking. Now, what is happening with the Supercoach? Why is every time I record, all of a sudden the Supercoach site decides to, to mess it up? All right, so let's put Jordan on field for a start. Obviously, Hewitt's not playing this week, um, so that's a consideration. Um, oh, man, this is just frustrating, right? Now, the one thing you do also need to be aware of is that um, if you're bringing in, say, a Berry, if you're bringing in a Flanders, if you're bringing in, um, uh, uh, say, a Hogan or something like that, these guys all have the same buy next week. And so I already have Flanders and Sexton, um, and I've brought in Berry. So now I have three all in the forward line. So one good thing that I've done is that now I have, you know, Darcy Wilson in this midfield. I can, you know, switch it, switch out, say, Flanders into there and cover him with a midfield um, rookie instead. So I'm still going to be able to cover that at least one of those guys um, with that. Uh, so, uh, so, so yeah, this is, this is how the team is looking, of course. Uh, I'll sort it out for what I'm looking at this week on field. I'll probably loop Darcy Wilson because he has the early game. So I can loop him and then throw Hewitt on field for another guy if he, if he scores a good, uh, good score, but I don't think he will because of his role. Um, Barry, I'd rather have on field than some other, than him, but, We'll see. Um, Cabin, I'm going to have the E just in case he gets a, 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 a absolute bumper score, but I can't loop him on anyway. Um, let's put Grundy back on field. Uh, and 
I can also put Williams off. So let's put Howes on. And of course, um, I can loop as well. Well, I don't have anyone to loop with, so that's fine. Um, so that, there's the team moving into next week. Now, what do I think in terms of VC and C? Uh, well, look, back-to-back 130 scores means that Nick Dacos is the, is the clear and obvious choice for a VC on a Thursday night. Um, and that's who I'll be rolling with. And then captain, we let's have a look at the rack matchups. So Hawks, I don't love for a rack matchup. And then Essendon, who are typically... Well, Goldie's actually been pretty good, but Grundy versus Goldie mm, at the SCG, maybe. I don't love it. Um, let's have a look at other matchups that we've got. GWS are playing West Coast, of course. So if you've got, say, Tom Green, you'd be going there for sure. Um, or a Hogan or something like that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have anyone in that boat. Uh, maybe a Butters against Richmond. They've been giving up points to mids, uh, obviously. Uh, Bont against Gold Coast. Mm, don't love, but it isn't Mars. But Gold Coast, are, you know, they're, they're going good, man. And I assume, um, let's say two clocks down Bont maybe. And then Rao goes head-to-head with Libba. That's probably the situation. Yeah, I'm not loving that as a as an option. Um, so yeah, maybe Butters is the one. Port versus Richmond at the G. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's the... Oh, you could also go Sydney against Destin. Yeah, you could go you could go Heaney if you really wanted to risk it for the biscuit. Um, but no, I'm probably going to go safe. I'm going to go Butters here in this, in this position at the captain at the moment. But I mean, realistically, are you probably going to get need anyone other than Dacos? against St. Kilda, who not only, like, if they put him behind the ball at times, he'll rack it up there. He should be able to go well in either either in midfield or to behind the ball if he goes there. But um, we haven't really seen behind the ball Nick Dacos yet. So there you have it, guys. Uh, I'm not boosting this week. I don't think it's worth it. Um, well, I will go through what I can do. So this 177K, right? So uh, what it will allow me to do, if I go Gibkus up to uh, D'Ambrosio next week, that's about 70K, right? So 74K. That leaves me with a Rian about 100K. I can also go Yo straight up to Sheasel with that 100K. Uh, and that is probably what I'm doing. And then I'll boost in um, where down to uh, Carol. That is what I'm looking at doing next week if everything remains the same. Now, if Yo turns, out, turns around and his t- time on ground increases, his CBAs increases, and I'm happy with him moving forward, I will probably keep him. I could potentially also trade Nick Martin to a Sheasel and then move Yo in. I could go uh, Nick Martin to a Crouch. I could even throw 100000 on, say, Nick Martin and get up to a Took for the next week and hold that off. So there are other options that I'm looking at, um, but only time will tell. The most likely one, though, is, is Gibkiss, obviously, to, to Massimo, because even if he does score poorly, really, like if he goes to 60... It's still probably better than any other current defensive rookie that I don't already have. So, uh, yeah, that's the most likely trade and, and why I need the cash for next week. Um, but, yeah, saving the boost. Two trades necessary for me this week. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks for catching up. And I know it was a long one, but it was worth it. See you guys.